to Philippians here this morning, um, kind of a thought for the new year as far as kind of a, a theme, so to speak, for our for this year as a church, uh, for however long the Lord allows us, I guess we'll say it that way. Um, certainly there's a lot of memes in social media about 2020 finally ending and uh, all of the uh, hopes and anticipations of 2021. What I think is ironic, um, obviously these were all starting before New Year's, mm-hmm. uh, what I think is great here in the Midwest is that n- the New Year would start with a ice storm that stretched from like Oklahoma to Wisconsin, uh, pretty much the entire Midwest, mm-hmm. and uh, kind of reminded us that we still don't know. Uh, the, the, the changing of the calendar didn't, didn't uh, uh, change the reality that uh, there's still going to be things we have to deal with and things we have to go through. And uh, I hope that we've learned from our journey with the nation of Israel from this last year uh, that there's a lot of times that our God, in fact, we can say every time, our, our God uses times when our worlds are upside down to remind us of who He is and to show us who He is. And, and uh, while we can look with dismay on certain circumstances, certainly, We need to look with anticipation for what God will do in even those circumstances. And uh, it's always a great joy to live that out as well. 
Before we look to uh, flip the ends here, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you again for your word. I pray that you would challenge us here this morning. I pray that you allow me to decrease, that you alone would increase. I, I pray that we'd be able to grasp the truths of this and, and certainly seems very needed as we begin a new year. Uh, I just pray that we'd be able to see it not only in our lives, but certainly as we continue on through your word and uh, see the importance of, of our thoughts, our thinking, um, our attitudes, and I just pray that you would direct us and and just allow your word to have an impact in our hearts and lives today, now. And we thank you for what you will do. In Jesus' name, amen. A question for us, um, certainly this morning and certainly for this year, is uh, what's our thinking? What is our thinking as we begin a new year? Uh, what is our thinking as we continue on with COVID, and, and if COVID couldn't be worse, what was the recent announcement that the new, more contagious variant is now on our soil, and and uh, the turmoil that uh, is certainly stirred up because of that. Um, but what are we could we could ask that question in numerous ways, just by putting the uh, the emphasis on, on a different word, um, and certainly it could have a a, a great uh, uh, significance in that regard. You know, what are you thinking? <laughs> Or what are you thinking? And just by checking, checking out the different words and emphasis, certainly that very question can have a big difference. Someone has uh, calculated, and I don't know how they were able to do this. Maybe this makes sense to some of you. It doesn't make sense to me. But it takes 60 to 70 watts. This makes sense to me. I can understand these first points. It takes 60 to 70 watts of electricity to run a laptop, depending on the size. Obviously, the bigger the monitor, the more power it takes. Take a minimum of 70 watts of electricity to run a desktop. Somehow they calculated that it only takes 14 watts of power to uh, run our brain in deep thought. Now, I don't know what the point of that is. Does that mean that we are awfully efficient? Or is that just indicating other things? I, I'm not sure what the point of the, those statistics are, but 67, 60 to 70 for a laptop, 70 plus for a desktop, and uh, 14 for our brains. Uh, I think that uh, technology uh, will never never duplicate what God has created. I can say it that way. Um, but it is a funny statistic nonetheless. And another person said this, and I thought this was great. Watch your thoughts, for they become your words. And that, that certainly is biblical. Watch your words... For they become your actions. That as well become, seems very biblical. Watch your actions because they become your habits. And watch your habits for they become your character. It all began with what we were thinking about. How we thought. And uh, it's, I think it's great importance of, of, of our thinking. I mentioned last week that society has a thinking problem and, and kind of the exclusion of the thinking of, of mental health uh, certainly has a, to an extent, a, a misnomer. And again, certainly as we consider Carol and this lady that I mentioned earlier, there are times when uh, physicians, surgeons, uh, neurologists go into our brains and are able to fix things. And, and certainly before they are able to do that, there are things that are not right. And it affects the way we function as a, as a human but we have to realize that there's a difference between the function of our brain and the actual aspect of, of our thought process. And, and sometimes that's hard to differentiate um, because sometimes they're so connected. Uh, but I hope to show us here from Philippians chapter 4 that there is a disconnect. Um, that what our brain computes is not necessarily, we're not, as a child of God, we're not victims to the senses that our brains are picking up, if I could say it that way. Certainly, uh, again, society as a whole, neighbors, family members, can have an impact on the way we think, correct? Yes. Uh, we can certainly be controlled to an extent, if we allow it, we can be controlled to an extent uh, by our environment, by what surrounds us. Medically speaking, a doctor's bedside manner really does have a, an impact uh, on health, on, on outcome, I think a lot of times. Uh, if a doctor just comes in and says, yeah, 
you're done. You're, you're, you're toast. Well, the likelihood is th there's a very low survival rate. The doctor comes in and, and with a very nice bedside manner and, and, and gives some inkling of hope. It's amazing what the human body, again, created by God, uh, is able to do when there is hope to hang on to. And I, 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 sometimes you're speechless on how that happens. Other times you, you wonder why it didn't happen the way we're hoping it to happen. Uh, but medically speaking, certainly we can't deny that uh, a bedside manner really does have an impact on, on outcomes many times. If you surround yourself with anxious people, what often happens? We ourselves become very anxious. Um, why does a locker room speech at halftime make a difference on the field? Again, we can be impacted by, by our environment. Why does feeling like someone believes in you, that's a phrase that's not necessarily a, a biblical phrase, but often one that is used. Why does it, when someone believes in us, does that make a difference in, uh, in our tackling of, of life and, and life's problems? If someone starts laughing or giggling, why is it that uh, suddenly we find ourselves in a different mood? Uh, a great one, if somebody yawns. I was going to yawn here, but I was afraid then that you would all start yawning at me and then I'd be yawning back and uh, the, the service would be over. But uh, how often uh, it happens that someone yawns and uh, you can't help but, in fact, I bet all of you right now are thinking, I kind of want to yawn right now because he just said it. <laughs> Josiah just did. <laughs> you know, the, the truth is, is our thinking sometimes can be, if we allow it to be controlled by what surrounds us. And uh, I don't believe that that can be denied. I don't think that can be denied, uh, certainly uh, uh, physically, uh, scientifically, but I also don't believe that it can be denied even biblically. That, that there's a lot of times that our thinking, the way we think, is dictated by what surrounds us. But what I also do believe is what Paul is trying to challenge the church of Philippi in Philippians chapter 4 is it doesn't have to. And uh, that's what I want to encourage us here this year. And especially today as we begin uh, the year to remind us that as a child of God, what goes on around us does not have to dictate the way we think. Now, our brain, again, that the human organ picks up all from all of our senses, the various senses that God has made us, takes that, all that input and uh, comes to conclusions in the, the concepts of our brain and responds accordingly by what is being received by the senses. But our actual essence of, of our thinking, our thought life, our, our, our then what turns into our words, what turns into our actions, what turns into our habits, what turns into our character, does not have to be dictated by our senses if we're a child of God. And uh, I think that's something that is often overlooked and missed. And uh, we need to be challenged by that. I'm not sure what's gonna happen this week. If you're keeping up on all the details on, on the Wednesday, uh, I don't know what's going to happen when Congress meets and uh, decides whether or not to accept the, uh, the election outcome. Uh, I know there's going to be a, a, the hopes of a, a large gathering there in D.C., and I know a lot of senators are uh, proposing the fact that they will not accept the uh, electoral college votes from those states in question. And, and uh, I, I don't. I know there's a lot of people that are riled up on both sides, and uh, I have no idea. We may be in a completely different world by next Sunday. I, I don't know how this is all going to play out this week, but you know the reality is, it doesn't matter because that doesn't have to control the way we think, and we've got to be cautious with that. For Thanksgiving, we looked at Ephesians, Ephesians Philippians chapter four. In fact, we, we kind of began with verse 4, Philippians 4, 4, and ended with verse 9. And uh, my last point, as Caitlin says, my last points are always the shortest. My last point involved verses 8 and 9, and it was just a reminder in regards to the connection. If you remember for Thanksgiving, it was a connection of, of peace. We have to know peace in order to truly be thankful. And those verses kind of connect those two. And uh, we concluded with verses 8 and 9 in the connection of, of the way that we are thinking. Uh, it directly correlates to the peace that, that is mentioned beginning in verse 4 thereafter. And uh, I've looked back over my notes and, and ultimately I, we spent very little time in verses 8 and 9, probably because we know them very well. But we want to begin here this morning right where pretty much where we left off and then go several verses beyond that. 
and to kind of look at the very reality of, of our thinking here as we begin a new year. What, what are you thinking? 21, thinking. Uh, beginning back in verse 7, it says, And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Obviously, again, at Thanksgiving, the, the focus was the connection of peace and Thanksgiving, which really kind of started, being, verse 6 was a very clear point of connecting those two points of thankfulness and, and peace. Verse 7 concludes on the topic of peace, and the peace of God which passes all understanding. And we know this, we've probably quoted this, you've heard this, I read that verse not, what, what, a month ago. But do we realize that the peace that comes from our God always goes beyond the norm? It passes, it surpasses, it extends beyond the way we can think. Beyond, in other words, uh, as we connect the senses and our brain computes and it comes to a conclusion, and if we allow those conclusions to direct our thinking, our, our thinking then uh, uh, has a limit on it, and far beyond the limits of our ability to think is the peace of God, which we have then a choice. Am I going to be limited by my conclusions, or am I going to understand and live out the peace of God that passes all understanding? I'm not trying to get into sociology and anthropology and all of those wonderful blessings that, uh, boy, it goes back to college days, and Caitlin was just talking about the blessings of that here this morning at breakfast, even. But what it is a true reminder, the case, number one, the case for the mind. There are a lot of uh, people that have tremendous peace. Let me back up. There are a lot of ch children of God. There are a lot of Christians who exhibit tremendous peace even in the presence of great adversity. And it makes you marvel. How did they do that? I believe that is why when Paul was Paul and Silas were in the jail in Philippi and singing, I believe that was why the jailer came in and said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? Because you're exhibiting a, a peace that passes all understanding. Why is it that at midnight you're able to rejoice when normally what we hear at midnight is crying out and moaning? You guys are singing praise to your God. I want that. And, and certainly there are many who have been able to live that out, a peace that passes all understanding because they've chosen to not be limited by the conclusions of their brain that dictates then their thinking but by the very reality of a peace that passes all understanding. Now, I'm not talking about those that are just, uh, you know, John Wayne tough, throw a little dirt on it, and I'm not going to cry, <laughs> uh, that, that are, are committed to, I, I'm not going to show emotions. I, that, that's not peace of God. Uh, being emotionless to the best of our ability is not living out the peace of God. There is a peace that passes all understanding that goes beyond stubbornness, that goes beyond... Uh, a machoism, we could use that word, that goes beyond that uh, I'm just going to be too tough and I'm, I'm not going to let anybody see my emotions. That's not living out this peace that passes all understanding. There is a reality of facing adversity, maybe even with tears in your eyes, but having a peace that boggles the minds of those that watch. That's what God offers to us. And in connection with that, we come to verse 8, and it says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Let me, let me back up. As we think on those eight checklists, and I'll have on the screen here in a moment our, our checklist of things that we need to be thinking about. Back up, because I want to make this point, because I think this is where the, my point begins. Verse 7 again, the very last phrase, that shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Verse 7 kind of introduces a thought that the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your what? Your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. I don't believe that that's a reference, and I think even the Greek points this out. This is not a reference of the brain that's, that floats between our ears. This is not a reference to the conclusion of stimulus that we pick up through our senses that is interpreted by our brain. Uh, the heart and minds of verse 7 is, is not, it's almost to an extent, 
disconnected to our brain, uh, the the human organ in our heads, uh, and and it goes to all to who we are, to the essence of who we are. In fact, the word heart there has that idea of affection or passion. Uh, that that goes beyond our our brains. That goes to our character. That goes to what it is that we love, that we admire, that we long for. Uh, uh, so he shall keep your hearts. And then that, that word minds also has that idea that goes beyond and has a, of our conscience, if we can say it that way, of our judgment. And so when we look at verse 7, it's remind us the peace of God is, this isn't about our brain, it's not about the brain that can have malfunction. It's not about the physical reality of, of, of uh, we often interchange the word mind. This is, about, this is about the reality of who we are, our hearts, our our uh, essence, our being, our, our source of affection and, and passion and our judgments and, and uh, our conscience. And, and all of that will be kept by our God. Now, that's an amazing reality that our, what our brains can do uh, by uh, uh, repeated stimuli, if you know what I'm trying to say. There are a number of years ago, was it five years ago? Five, six years ago? After my parents had bought the house, the street from us and uh, they're still living in Downers Grove and we spent many nights and weekends just working on different projects over there and uh, we had a, a little radio that we could connect to our phone and, and we play played music while we worked and uh, our playlist was very short and there was obviously no Wi-Fi or anything over there and uh, I think this was before we had uh, unlimited yeah. data and all that that's available today and, and so we just had a short playlist and uh, even so today, if we hear any of those songs, you can almost smell sheetrock mud. Uh, you know, we might, we might be in, we might be in uh, the, the, the pet store where it's Aroma City there, and uh, suddenly that, that song comes to our mind. Certainly they're not playing it over the PA, but the song comes to your mind, you're like, I smell, I smell mud. <laughs> it's amazing how, how, how that, that works out. I don't recall, and I haven't heard these songs anymore, but I remember in, in high school staying up s several times, working late, typing up a, a, a paper, or getting up, actually what I did was get up early and work on a paper, uh, back in typewriter days, and uh, um, playing music quietly because the rest of the house was sleeping. And I remember for quite some time thereafter, anytime I heard those songs, I'm back to 3.30 in the morning typing out a paper. Um, I think our minds, our brains, let me use the right word, our brains are amazing in that regard that it, it can recall. Our, our long-term memory is a fascinating reality that God has given us the, the blessing. Uh, sometimes it's not a blessing. Sometimes it's a curse, I think. Uh, uh, but it's a blessing that we have that will remind us of where we've been and those memories, memories uh, uh, that we have. But verse 7 isn't talking about memories. This verse 7 is not talking about our brain. Verse 7 is not talking about those precious thoughts that we've had from the past or maybe those early morning typing out papers. Back before, have you ever, let me just back up, let me toot my own horn here for a moment. Have you ever tried to type a paper on a typewriter at 3 30, 4 o'clock in the morning? You make one mistake, pull that out and start all over again. It's a, it's a futile effort at, at the early time, at least for me. Joe probably could write a whole dissertation on whatever topic he wants early in the morning. But, but for me, you, you know, and it, it often will get down to like the last paragraph, and you misspell a word, uh, pull it out, start all over again, and, and uh, here we go. Uh, it's amazing how the brain can remind us of those things that are from many years ago. But verse 7 is talking about something beyond that. And don't become victim to the senses of, that we've experienced around us, that it dictates my thinking. This is what dictates our thinking, our hearts and our minds being kept through Christ Jesus. And when we're able to do that, then we are able to have this checklist. Uh, here we go. Think on these things that are true, that which is truly eternally true, what, that which is indeed sure. Now that doesn't mean that it's been fact-checked and proven to be uh, uh, true. In other words, there's a lot of bad things that we could, certainly, how, what was it, the 350,000 people have died from COVID? That's a true fact. Or, I guess that even could be somewhat debated to that extent, but it's a true fact as far as the records go. You, you can think on that, that is, that is true, 
But the significance of that is not to the same extent of what this word true is all about. Uh, the eternal, true, and sure. Is it honorable? Is it honest? Think on things that are indeed honorable. Think on things that are innocent, that are holy, or the word there is just in the King James. Think on things that are pure. Think on things that are lovely, friendly, amiable, things that are, are nice. And I'm not just talking, go to a happy place, go to a happy place, go to a happy place. Uh, uh, certainly not with Philippians 4, because this isn't talking about the responses of our mind in regards to our stimulus. Remove the absence of your brain and go to who you are. That's what verse 7 is directing us to and explaining in verse 8. Think of things that which are of good report. Things that are of virtue. Things that are of praise. Think on those things. And ultimately, Paul is writing to a church in a time frame that they are going through persecution as all of Christianity was in this very time frame. Uh, the world at that time was not friendly to Christianity. And during that time frame, while in prison, Paul writes this letter and says to this church, regardless of what you are going through in this moment, don't allow this moment to dictate your thinking pattern. But instead, in this moment, I know that you are in hiding. I know that many of you are underground. I know that some of you have lost dear friends and relatives and maybe spouses to, to the cause against Christianity. Some of you, as Paul is writing, are, have lost loved ones who were burned at the stake, who were eaten by the lions. They knew what it was to suffer for Christ. And they lived in a time frame unlike ours. We cannot, at this point, say that we are anywhere near what they were living through. They lived in a time frame where to profess Christ often was a death sentence on their heads. And if you want to have a stimulus that is dictating your brain's thinking that easily could dictate the way that we speak and act and our habits and our character, it was them, not us. It was them. And Paul writes to them, finally, brethren, <laughs> because the peace of God that passes all understanding that is able to keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, because of that fact, regardless of what you're going through today, Here's what you need to think about. Think on these things, true and honest and just and pure and lovely, a good report of virtue, of praise. Don't be dictated by the essence of your senses that surround you. Now, we live in a day and age that they didn't live in, that we have far more stimulus hitting us than they did. Uh, they didn't have the internet. They didn't have instant news. Uh, uh, they didn't have social media to bother us throughout the day. Uh, uh, they, or, or many times mislead us throughout the day. They, they didn't have those things that we have today that present the even greater essence of, of stimulus. But what they did have was far more persecution than we have ever known. And in their scenario, Paul says, it's the peace of God that passes all understanding because it keeps your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And because of that, you are able to do this even in this. Even when your brain says, this does not compute, this does not compute, or maybe your brain is saying, abort, abort, abort. Or when your brain is saying, I can't, I can't, I can't. When your brain is taking in all the senses, even when you're just seeing Church of Philippi, and you're seeing good godly men and women going down for the cause of Christ. And, and your brain begins to compute and say, stand back, stand down, don't move forward, don't do this. Paul reminds this church that, no, you don't have to be controlled by the stimulus of your brain. Be controlled by your heart and your mind that is being kept by Christ, by a peace that passes all understanding, that enables you to do this literally when the world is falling apart. Think on these things. Think on things that are beneficial to you through Christ. Not just a response to stimulus of this world. Are there things in life which don't fit this model? Have we, even in 2020, have, have we not lived through things that didn't fit any of those points? <laughs> Wasn't pure, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, of virtue, of, of praise. Certainly we all have faced things in the last even month that didn't fit that mold, that didn't fit that parameter, that wasn't 
checking off many things of that checklist if we just resided in our own senses, resided in our own mental conclusions. But it's an amazing reality as being a child of God that we can still do that even when the conclusion of our brain says, no, this isn't going to work. This isn't right. Like, we, we, we can't do this. Look at verse 10. Not only do we have the case for the mind, but look at the case for contentment. Let me just start by saying this. I think a lot of issues in regards to, as we call them, incorrectly call them, mental health today. And again, as I said last week, when I say mental health, I'm not talking about like, like the carol, that actually there's something wrong, that physically wrong that is going on within the wirings of the brain, of the mind. Certainly tumors as well have that impact. Uh, low oxygen has an impact. Uh, uh, dementia has an impact. And, and so when I'm saying mental health, I'm talking about what is often declared as mental health, which is simply a wrong way of thinking. I'm not talking about all the, the physical problems that can go wrong with this. I'm thinking of talking about the way that we think in response. I think a lot of those wrong thinkings, the wrong thought patterns are because of a lack of something as simple as contentment. If you think about it, I, I, I think I'm right. <laughs> I think a lot of times our discontentment is what leads us to wrong thinking. It's our discontentment that keeps us from verse 8. It's our discontentment in what we are facing, what we are doing, what we are uh, receiving, what we are seeing. It's our discontentment with where we are and uh, what we're dealing with. It's that discontentment that we allow then to reprogram our thinking. And a lot of mental health, as it's incorrectly defined today, really has nothing to do with mental or health. It has to do with we lack contentment. <laughs> That's all what this boils down to. Look at verse 10. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me has flourished again wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and how to be abound. Everywhere and in all things I am directed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. There's an interesting picture here of contentment that Paul presents. And I, I think it goes beyond what we normally define as contentment. We could begin by verse 10 and we could incorrectly state that verse 10 is saying that Paul is rejoicing because they are meeting his need. And I don't believe that there's anything wrong with rejoicing when someone meets your need. I, I, think, that's, I think that's worthy of doing. I think it's great to rejoice when God has met needs even through others. And uh, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that kind of rejoicing. But that is not what Paul is speaking about here in verse 10. Notice what he says. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Let me give you the details. The church of Philippi has been, has sent, like, like we just did. We, they, we sent gifts to our missionaries. The church of Philippi, it's certainly probably not a Christmas gift. So they didn't even celebrate Christmas back in those days. But certainly they've given a gift to Paul that was meeting a need that Paul legitimately had. We all agree, but ultimately is what's happening. The church of Philippi, even with great sacrifice, has met a need in the life of Paul, and Paul says, I am rejoicing greatly. But notice he's not rejoicing in them, he is rejoicing in the Lord. Look at verse 11, because it takes us one more step. Not that I speak in respect of want, you could almost put a slash need there. Ultimately, what Paul is saying, I am not rejoicing based on the fact that this was something that I needed or wanted. Ultimately, what he is saying then is, I am rejoicing in the Lord, not because you have met a need of mine. That, that doesn't dictate my rejoicing. When I'm rejoicing in the Lord, this is, this is literally what he seems to be saying. I'm rejoicing in the Lord because you gave of your hearts in worship to God, to me. And I am rejoicing to him for you because of what you did, because of how you did it, because I know it was a sacrifice for you, not because it was something that I have a, a, a need that has been met. Now, I, I can attest to the fact that as, as a family, we have re received much uh, uh, from ministry. Uh, we have often had uh, uh, meats in our freezer uh, honestly, we, we drove a, a vehicle to church today that was given to us. 
Uh, uh, it's an amazing reality when things, when needs are met in that regard. And uh, as uh, Matt came home and had vehicle problems even while he was home, and as a parent, there's always a concern, is, he, is the guy gonna make it back? <laughs> uh, sadly, we had to go out and buy him better jumper cables because he's been using them. And uh, uh, there's that, the concern. And, and we just get in our vehicle, and for the most part, it, it gets us where we wanna go, and, and things have worked well. And there's rejoicing because of the gift, because it was a need, because it met a need that we had. And it's a rejoicing that while we've had to do some repairs, and Matt has to do many repairs on his truck, we haven't had to do very many on this van. And, and there's rejoicing in that. It's almost like a, a welcome break. And I know that the time is coming, the, speed, the odometer says time is coming. <laughs> and uh, the, the fun is about to begin. But on the other hand, there's a rejoicing. But that isn't what Paul is rejoicing about. He's not saying I had a bill of $300 and you guys miraculously sent me $300 and I rejoice in the Lord and the fact that that need was met. He literally is saying in verse 11, I am not rejoicing because this is something that I needed. I'm not rejoicing. My contentment wasn't based on, let me say it that way. His contentment was not based on I have a need and now it's been met. I am now content. That's not what contentment is. That is selfishness. I have a need, it's meant, and now I'm happy. That's not contentment, that's selfishness. What Paul is pointing out is, I am rejoicing because I am content. Regardless of what you gave or didn't give, I am content. I am rejoicing not because I have my need met. I am rejoicing because you and ultimately showed your faith in God by giving that gift. And that is why I rejoice. That's a whole level of contentment beyond what is the normal contentment. Which brings us back to verse 7, the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There's a peace that passes all understanding that, even con that often controls our contentment if we allow it to. Verse, verse 12 Paul says, I know both how to be a base and I know how to abound. I know how to have uh, 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 my feet kicked out from under me, but I also know how to stand up on my own feet. I, everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry. Have you ever tried to do that? Have you ever tried to be full when your stomach is growling? Paul did. Because his contentment wasn't based on, I have my needs met, now I am happy. His contentment wasn't based on, well, now that everything is met in my life, I am content. His contentment was based on a thinking. Not on the result of the stimulus that surrounded him, but on the way he thought. And he was able to rejoice in the Lord even when he was hungry. He was able to rejoice in the Lord also when he was full. He was able to rejoice in the Lord when he was able to abound, but he was also able to rejoice in the Lord when he suffered greatly. Why? Because he had learned how to be content. Contentment was a result of the peace of God that passes all understanding, verse 7. And, and as such, his contentment wasn't based on I got what I needed. <laughs> I got my way, now I'm happy and I'm content and I'm rejoicing in my God. That is not contentment. Contentment is a thinking that rejoices in your God, come what may. It's a way of thinking that is not controlled by the here and now, the news, the media, the circumstances of life, the, the, the debt to income ratio. It's not controlled by uh, the medical needs. It's not controlled by the family needs. Contentment is something that is a thinking of the mind. And I point to my brain, it, it doesn't happen here. It's who we are, it's our heart. It goes contrary to the brain. We'll say it that way. Because that goes contrary to this organ between our ears. Because the organ between our ears collects the stimuli. It looks at the checkbook register. It looks at the repair bill for the vehicle. It, it looks at the medical diagnosis. And our brain computes all of that and says, this is not good. This is not good. Contentment is a reality of a heart that says, it doesn't matter. That doesn't dictate my contentment. That doesn't control who I am in Christ. And therefore, I am able to be content. A case 
for contentment. It's not a. Uh, hmm. It's not just simply based on easily said words. <laughs> well, I'm content. True contentment is not something that we can put a facade up and convince others of. True contentment is a rejoicing at midnight in a dungeon at what God is doing. That is true contentment, a result of the mind. Look at verse 13. Last point, and it'll probably be the quickest one, Kate. The case for might. We, we know verse 13, but I can say you, I can, I can say you this. <laughs> I can tell you this. I bet almost every time that we have referred or heard of verse 13, it was taken right out of context. Verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. This is not a verse that is intended to be used to say, I can do this. <laughs> this is not a verse that says, this is going to drive us to perfection. This is not a verse that is about a, go get them. This really is not about winning a championship or getting a promotion. This has nothing to do with being able to get... Well, let me just ask you, have you ever had to try to get a lug nut off of a tire? As, as you're, 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 you're twisting, when I worked at Cherry Tree and I had to do a lot of this, I'd work and I'd work and, you know, you're to the point where your face is all red, all the bl blood vessels in your neck are popping out and you're... <coughs> I can't. And they had some amazing, some lube stuff, spray it on there. You wait a little bit, go talk to Joe, you get a Pepsi or whatever, in case they come back. <coughs> I can't. And you, you get up on the, the lug wrench and you're kind of hopping on it. I'm a big guy. I'll hop on it. This thing's not budging. The whole, the whole vehicle's doing this on the, 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 you know, the, the lift, but the lug nuts aren't coming off. There's a guy that I worked with, still works with, I guess, would still be there, and I don't work with him anymore also named Joe. I walk into his office, it was right next to where the mechanic area was, and I'd say, hey, hey, uh, 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 Joe, I bet you can't get the lug nut off. This guy's like 15 years older than me, I'm guessing, at least. He, he, was, he was older. All I had to do was, I, I bet you can't. Whoa, my eyes, that was George. You just watch me do this, and, and he would. He'd go out there and he did it off. I've spent three hours, and, and every, ounce of strength I have is now gone and I've turned all sorts of colors of red and purple and blue and I've quoted this verse like I can't do this he goes out there and he does this and he does this and pop <laughs> what you the guy's you know a third of my size how would he what? I, I'm, you know it's kind of like the jar thing I, I loosened before you didn't I this verse is not about getting lug knots off of a tire I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. It has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with getting that promotion. It has nothing to do with making it through the day. It has nothing to do with accomplishing the championship basketball game. Nothing to do with so many of the ways that we quote that verse. It has everything to do with this. When the world is caving in around us, and our brain is interpreting all the stimulus that it is receiving by all of our senses and saying, can't do, can't do, can't do. And our thinking, our character, who we are, our heart and mind of verse 7, begins to get a, a, a kick in the shin, so to speak, and begins to say, I have nothing to rejoice in. I have no hope. Uh, there's nothing positive going on right now. Everything is falling apart. When that happens, and we come back to verse 8, and we say, I need to be thinking about that which is true, and that which is honest, and that which is just, and that which is pure, and that which is lovely, and that which is of good report, and that which has virtue, and which that has praise. And then the next words we say are, but I can't right now. I know I need to be, and I know that there's a peace of God that passes all understanding, I just can't feel it right now. And I know I ought to be thinking and having that checklist in my mind of saying, am I thinking about these things? And I go through everyone, nope, 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 and nope. I'm not. I'm not. I know I am not. I know I should, but I know I'm not. But I can't right now. 
I can't be content with where I am right now. I can't just allow all the things that are going around me to not control me. I can't do that. That's what verse 13 is put there for. Nothing to do with getting lug nuts off. Everything to do to remind us you can do this. If you are a child of God, you can do this. You may still lose the championship game. You may never get that lug nut off. You may never have enough money to do what you want to do in your life. You may never have a vehicle that runs in, in, in a trustworthy manner. You may never fix that leak in your living in the parsonage. There were leaks in that roof that we tried and tried. We never could fix those. You may have a leak that you will never fix. You may have a medical condition that you will never outlive. But what you do have as a child of God is the strength to be content. What you do as a child of God have the means to think on things that are not focused on the stimulus that you receive from your senses. What you do have as a child of God is the means by which to understand and live out the peace of God that passes all understanding. You do have that strength because that strength comes from Christ. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That's what verse 13 is for. Sure, it is a great motivational verse. It probably is used in almost every high school basketball championship locker room speech ever. You can do all things through Christ. Now just go out there and score more points than the opponent. You can do this. Well, the other team is hearing the same thing. You can do this. No, that's not what verse 13 is about. It, it means nothing about that. What verse 13, this would be a horrible locker room speech, but what verse 13 is saying, even if you come back here in, what, 45 minutes and you have been beaten like you've never been beaten before and you guys are the worst losers of losers, you can be content with that. <laughs> that, that's, not, that, that that's not a very good locker room speech. I probably would not be a very good coach, but that is exactly what the Bible says. <laughs> You can go out there and you can fall flat on your face and nothing will work for you. You can try to shoot the basketball. You can try to get your job done. You can try for that promotion. You can try to get your car to run. You can try to get the lug nuts off. You can try and you can try and you can try. And sadly, we are all perfectly able to fail in all of those. But that should not dictate our contentment. That should not dictate what we think or how we think. That should not dictate the reality of the peace of God that passes all understanding. Because as a child of God, our hearts and minds are kept through Christ Jesus. And we have the strength to do that. I have no idea what 2021 is going to have for us. There's hope that's going to be better than 2020. I can tell you this, changing the calendar didn't change anything that was going on December 31st. Everything that was happening on December 31st still is happening on January 1st and thereafter. But I can tell you, we have the strength to think differently. To live out the peace of God that passes all understanding. Let's go out and confuse some people by the peace and contentment that we live. Because we have the might that they don't. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Let's pray. So we thank you again for your word. I thank you for how you will use us this year. I pray that as we often will, if we're still here on this earth, we often will fail. We often will not measure up. We often will not, even the simple things of getting a lug nut off, we won't do it. But I pray that we wouldn't allow that stimulus that hits our brains to dictate the way that we think that allow us to fall short of the very contentment that you've called us to. And it keeps us lacking in the peace that passes all understanding. I pray that this year we be able to learn the disconnect between the response of the stimulus of all that's going on around us to the way that we actually are and we think and behave. And I pray that you would use us we might have opportunities in the time frame when things are falling apart that others may come to us and say, I want that. I need that. I pray that you enable us to have that testimony this year. And we give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen.